So you both are known to everyone in here, but I thought I would give a brief introduction of each of you. Lindsay is a <clears throat> YouTuber known primarily for her work breaking down film and literary theory, among many other things, uh, podcasting, and now she is a debut novelist, a uh, generally multi-talented person. Hank is also a successful YouTuber and also a successful novelist and also a multi-talented successful person. So I'm going to hand it over to them. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hey. Uh, <laughs> for, for our sanity, if you can turn your cameras off, that would be great. Um, I, don't, I don't hate you or anything. Just try not to stare too much. It was yeah. funny watching, watching people all arrive. <laughs> And then there would be. I'm glad I life. turned it to. Am, uh, I, am I live? Is that me? Um, yeah, like, oh shit! I didn't put makeup on. Yeah, I um. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad I turned it to. Uh, what am I on? A speed review. Although I see that it's not working. I think there's too many people in this in this thing. Um, <laughs> that it's just kind of stick on you. Uh, <laughs> but can everybody hear me? Um, yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure I can definitely hear you. Um, oh boy. We've got, uh, we've got chat questions coming in, and they're coming in fast. But I, I have some questions to ask for you uh, first. Um, first, I'll just say, hi, it's nice to see you. I hope you're doing well. I know that it's crazy times. <laughs> there it is, the face. <laughs> oh, is there someone? Because like, I can't see anybody. Uh, so yeah, I suggest you guys put it on speaker view. I'll put it on speaker view. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. like the looks of fear. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. And, yeah, so, y yeah, my, um, uh, thank you for sending me uh, an early manuscript of the book and also the final Very early. Of the book. Uh. Yeah, it was cool to see the things that changed and also the things that I influenced. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very little things. Yeah, but I was like, ah, oh, she fixed it. She fixed that, <laughs> that moment when I was afraid about a thing that, wasn't, that I wasn't supposed to be afraid about. <laughs> that kind of thing. And How then I made different mistakes, other mistakes, <laughs> mistakes. How was your, uh, how's your book launch gone? I don't know. <laughs> I don't they, know. <laughs> they don't talk to me. Uh, I, I did get a, a message today saying that we were uh, Macmillan's number one title for Audible. Uh, for the for the last week so that's the only thing i have heard that's good um how are you how are you holding up uh, i think it's fine i guess i'm just tired how are you your skin yeah yeah how are you because you yeah. just went through this like two weeks ago yeah what i what i i, I don't know if this will be the same for you but i 100 percent uh, about two days into the second week I straight like went into a really kind of dark mind place where I thought that I would never do anything useful again and then I had no I added no value to the world so just expect that I don't know if it's coming for you but it it's was your last good idea <laughs> you've yeah, had I your said, last good I You're said done. that to Catherine and she was scoffed <laughs> the, she the, was like if only that sounds lovely um, the only good idea you've you've had it and it's done and you had a pretty good run all things considered you hey. made it it's yeah, absolutely. You beat the crawdads once before there were crawdads to beat. I did not beat the crawdads. I know, Just but clarity. before it, before they came out, you beat it. Right, I was ahead of the crawdads <laughs> on the list the before crawdads was published. Yeah. Oh wait, okay. So the, for those of you who don't know, before the or before where the crawdads thing is a. Uh, been like the number one New York Times book for the yeah. last two years straight, like almost it's very. With very rare interruptions, like American mm -hmm. Dirt, which everybody loves, <laughs> of that dirt. Um, yeah. But like, uh, that's kind of become like an in joke because I didn't even know yeah. about it um, until uh, like a, a, another mutual Caitlin Doty, who does Ask a Mortician on YouTube, was like, you know, like I don't know, you don't want like so much attention as like a, I don't know, aware the crawdads sing, and I legitimately thought she made that up. Like I thought that was, that was like name. that was like a fake. Yeah. like parody title of sounds uh, like one yeah. a literary fiction uh yeah and i and I, I i don't know what it's about i don't want to know what it's about i just know it's the enemy of me and everyone I've that's ever met. right yes <laughs> it's too popular i must hate it yes no, yeah, it's, it's, it's not what we're doing my family <laughs> <laughs> it has insulted oh. my honor crawdads yeah. don't sing <laughs> 
I am. Uh, I, people are saying that I'm quiet. I'm turning my audio up slightly by by degrees because my my box is extremely sensitive. Um, Lindsay, I want to ask you questions that's what about she your book. Said. Oh Lord! <laughs> uh, See, that's so, it. That's dated. <laughs> uh, so this is this is in re uh, reference to the idea that maybe we only have one real good idea. Uh, mm. what, so um, I'm very curious as a first novelist. Um, and, you know, who's been working on this project for a long time, but has also had a lot of other creative pursuits that you've been up to. Why, why was this the story that you felt like you were going to invest uh, tens of thousands of hours into? Uh, my Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> um, uh, my outlier. Hmm. I don't know. I think I, I, I you know, it, it's kind of chintzy, but like, I, I, I think it was sort of one of those, it's combination of just like things that are my aesthetic, you know, like, you know, mm -hmm. for fact and, uh, you know, coming of age stories and like just the general tone and like, you know, stealth, casual pop culture stuff and mm -hmm. incorporating that. But also just fundamentally, it was like a character dynamic thing. I kind of just was really obsessed with like trying to make this dynamic work. And, you know, I guess kind of parts like I, I knew I was like as soon as I can figure out how to make it work people will buy into it it only took 10 years <laughs> but but yeah I guess it was like a that that was pretty much it it's just like I was really drawn to that sort of you know almost iron giant ish um, mm -hmm. character dynamic but aged up so we you know have that sort of you know a boy and his ex almost uh, sort of thing going on but it is uh, you know comes with all this adult bag and you know uh, is just much more complicated than you normally normally see in those sorts of narratives. Yeah, um, and I, uh, one thing that I think you do a really good job of, and that I want to, I would want advice on, is <laughs> you seem to have a vivid, accurate, consistent picture of what what my aliens look like your aliens look like <laughs> and i have a hard time with this um you know i, I like I, I maybe don't visualize the same way or i don't know it, you know and this i think feeds somewhat into your um you know your you, a lot of your creative background being in film where you know that you don't have to describe perfectly what it looks like you know perfectly what it looks like because you're looking at it yes um, i i feel like that was one of the harder things was uh yeah putting into words because I actually I did work with a concept artist and I think it's interesting with yours oh. to uh because I, I, I it, it could also be argued that it's a style thing since the way Carl is described is at least in the first book is like so minimalist um yeah. so uh I, I think it's it's funny when you look at like the fan art like it's kind of all over the place um but like in my case I I had just had a really hard time like taking what was in my head and putting it into a visual that makes sense without it straight up being like, you know, have you seen How to Train Your Dragon? You know, like <laughs> actual pop culture references. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think the weird thing about like the concept artist was I like would send her pictures and would just like not try to describe it in like this, describe it in like this prosy way, but instead uh, describe, you know, just like, here's this picture and like, here's this thing from War of the Worlds and here's this thing from like, you know, my backyard. And uh, it's it still never quite clicked. So I don't know, I think it's one of those things where, uh, you know, whatever you visualize is not wrong, you know, because the mm -hmm. author, you know, can only, um, you know, uh, Ex you know, explain so in such vivid detail or in lack thereof and whatever the reader takes is not wrong. But like, I think in this case, I did have a very clear idea, still do. And so now that I'm starting to see fan art, I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> so whatever's in your uh, head is not wrong, but that is wrong. <laughs> well, it's more just like, oh, I should have just described it better. Like his head is bare. Like, <laughs> like, right. Like like mm -hmm. little things like I'm like mostly the well did, did the concept artist like make art yeah can you show people that art no um, <laughs> no can it's you show mine. me that art <laughs> sure <laughs> okay later well, <laughs> yeah oh wow wow that's really cool though that's really smart and not I would I think actually you did tell me that at one point but I had forgotten it. But that's a smart thing to do when you're working with something that is so, you know, complex. And character design is 
very yeah. important. You mentioned how to train your dragon. I think that Toothless is one of the best well designed. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, I think kind of, it sounds kind of yeah, it sounds like kind of cheesy, but Toothless is kind of perfect because like he is introduced as like this like was it he's called a night fury he's like mm-hmm. literally this terrifying thing mm-hmm. that is designed in such a way that can be really scary looking but can also be really cute and i think that's an interesting line to walk and not one mm-hmm. you see super often you know yep. i feel like district nine kind of but they're more like gross mm-hmm. than scary uh but they right. also definitely have the cute thing going on yeah i mean you think a lot about creature design like you talk about it you talk it, you've you've talked about that in videos about how you know, how to design for fear, how to design for um, relatability, eyebrows. Boy, eyebrows yeah. do a lot. Eyebrows do, do, do it all. Like, yeah. that's that's sort of the amazing thing about Wally is he didn't even have, he's just, he, he doesn't even have eyebrows. It's just the angle is yep. of the of the eyes or where it comes in. Uh, but I think, you know, that, that was always something I thought a lot about and like how, you know, to sort of toe that line and sort of make, a, you know, design a creature that is as foreign looking and an a, as alien looking as I thought I could go while also mm-hmm. still being like, uh, you know, you could see it as a person, a person with like someone with personality. Mm-hmm. Um, so why, why didn't you set your book in the present day? <laughs> I don't, I don't know why didn't you <laughs> well like she sort of did you, yours is like an au minus the past yeah you've created it, it yeah it's also an au um, yeah yeah they're both au's uh but mine's just I, an au of now yeah. yeah so i think i think it's 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 very telling like i think the main characteristic of your au is who is the president i don't know <laughs> it's not it's, it's not ours uh yeah. Uh, and I think that that is a lot of it because in my case, um, it, it, you know, this is something that I was always kind of shied away from was the fact that like fundamentally it's a government conspiracy book and to do that. You got to like involve mm-hmm. the government and you mm-hmm. to really engage with it, especially if you're going to try to be as serious and grounded as it ended up being, you know, it couldn't be like, um, cause I didn't want it to be goofy, like independence day as much mm-hmm. as I love independence day, the only good movie. Um, <laughs> but like you know it's just like it just the, the narrative just would not make sense um as like mm-hmm. taking place right. now like and i think even i've seen people like remark because there's something that happens uh with the president uh who was at the time uh man you might have heard of him george yep. w bush mm-hmm. uh he you know there, a thing happens with him that it, assumes there is still some political decorum in the world mm-hmm. like there is a sense of shame mm-hmm. uh <laughs> jorge w bush um yep. and uh and and i've seen people be like i don't believe this i don't buy this uh and i, I do kind of wonder how much of that is like you know because nothing matters yeah. anymore like just nothing yeah, I, nothing I buy matters. it as a person who was like politically aware when george w bush was president like i i buy that and i yeah the thing that because it mean, is a big deal in the context of you know the narrative mm-hmm. but also like nixon resigned because he got caught recording his political enemies you know mm-hmm. like the things that end up bringing people down are really the worst things they did you know mm-hmm. kind of like al capone getting nailed for tax evasion right right yeah that i mean the yep yeah, it's it's hard to remember what the world was like back then. It was yeah. Different. I can't wait for like, you know, 10, 20 years from now, like when people start doing the nostalgia cycle for, you know, 2016, 2020. And what will those narratives look like? Like mm-hmm. totally. Um, this leads to a question from the chat. I can't remember who wrote it because I didn't copy it out yet. But um what what was the weirdest thing you found that it turns out we didn't have in 2007? Uh, Because, you know, when you're writing a book that takes place in 2007, you have to not use phrases and ideas and concepts. I'm finding it more an issue in the second book because the second book is more attuned with, like, you know, society and the world and engaging with it. And it's kind of weird writing around Twitter not really being a thing yet. Yep. Um, Cell phone cameras, uh, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, And just sort of the major difference between flip phones and smartphones you know it is like a world of difference where you can't just like 
Google something. And uh, even though like the technology is, you know, fundamentally like pretty similar, but a lot of it is just words. Um, like I have an entire thread on Twitter that's just like neologisms that of like words that either were not uh, in the mainstream yet, you know, things like mm -hmm. woke or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, misgender, stuff like that, yeah. or, you know, words that just didn't exist yet, like selfie, you know, and uh, emoji. I think that was, people get like, no, emoji was word like, no, emoji came with the smartphone. Before yeah. that, we called it emoticon. <laughs> and, uh, and I think like th that's sort of the challenge is remembering like, um, the way language was like subtly different. And I feel, I wish I had gone further on that and the way people say things like, oh man, epic and <laughs> ponage and stuff like that. <laughs> awesome sauce. Yeah, there are, there are moments like that where- Rafflecopter. Like, they're, they're referencing songs and I'm just like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's even kind of date, like in the, in the context, like <clears throat> early on they talk about Skater Boy. And mm -hmm. I think even that was like two, like four years before right. that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just liked the idea of like this, this, like there's this kid that like is a big Avril fan because she likes the idea of wearing neckties. <laughs> so I have, I, uh, there's so many things that I want to talk about, but the thing that I want to talk about the very most is um, uh, a thing that is a thing for both of us. And that is the case more and more for all, all creators of all kinds, all authors, particularly, it used to be that, for the vast majority of books, now not for every book, that that like the work stood apart from the author who was fairly anonymous. And you didn't have some way to have lots of information about the author. You certainly didn't have a pre-existing relationship with the author. That is shifting for everybody where, you know, a lot of authors have social media followings and like people know who they are. And so the author is more inside the book than was once the case. And there are some authors that have always been playing with this and, and for a long time, but I feel like now, you know, there is a, there's a limitation to that, but there's also like, it may be something to lean into and make things sp even more special or more interesting. And like, I can see you leaning into it in moments, obviously. Yeah. Um, but, but overall, like, how do you feel about that, that change where, you might be more there as people are reading than than would once have been the case. I I tried not to, you know, it's kind of weird because I feel like I sort of inadvertently like, almost like primed my audience to be sort of receptive to this sort of book so that whenever the book was announced, it wasn't like weird, you know, it's just like, <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> you yeah, know, like that, yeah. that's on brand. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like uh, a, a big trend with like these influencer books you know people kind of expect it to be an extension of the youtube channel um and you know i've seen a lot of people say like if you expect that if you expect it to be like, the same tone um mm -hmm. you're gonna be disappointed if you know uh and right. and i you know it's like while you're creating it you can't really think like that consciously but you kind of can't help but be mindful of that and like i i like i snuck in some in jokes um and then like my i didn't think of like my my twitter like timeline is just flooded with people being like, I got it. I, got it. I saw, I saw, the I saw thing it. You did. I saw the thing. Good thing. <laughs> the thing. <laughs> uh, see yeah. the chat gets it. These guy gets it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think you know part of it is definitely a result of influencer culture. Um, I know a lot of literary agency publishers, like not just mine, are like ki kind of approaching people with platforms, whether they have a book or not. Um, right. I know two people that got literary agents just for, you know, having Twitter platforms. They didn't have a book idea. They didn't have a pitch ready, mm -hmm. you know, it, and, you know, I think that is kind of where it's trending because it's safer and you can't, you know, you can't blame them for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, I think when it comes to the publishing industry, like they're going to have to, they have to figure out how to make their money. Um, mm -hmm. And like, and, and, you know, it's hard to market stuff right now. And so people with built-in marketing are yeah. more, worth more. Yeah, it's, it's not like but, we did all of the work for her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but figuring out, um, but, but, but what you did with Axiom Zen is different from that. And it's actually like, people are going to be, like, publishers are going to be more wary of this because it's like, well, this isn't actually like the YouTube channel plus. Yeah. Right, this right, right. Like the value-added YouTube idea. This is a, this is a book that had, 
that a novelist would write, not a book yeah, that a it's a, would it's like David S. Pumpkins. It's its own thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the Just skeletons like are. Yes. Um, That's, I should put that in, in my like Twitter head, headline. It's like the David S. Pumpkins of books. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and I do, I do kind of wonder like if my book does do uh, really well, cause I don't know what the numbers are. Is our publishers mm -hmm. going to take the wrong lesson from this and, well, uh, they go, be, go hunting for YouTubers that have novels and be horribly disappointed. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I felt, I felt this the same way, but like what the, the process that both of us, both of us went through is that we wrote a book and then mm -hmm. we showed it to people. We weren't right. like, we're YouTubers, where's our book deal? Yeah, and I think a lot of people assume, and not unfairly so, sure. uh, that that is exactly what happens. And like, cause that was, I made an entire video addressing that um, mm -hmm. because I knew a lot of people were gonna think like, oh, I got my requisite YouTuber deal, book deal, because that's just what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's, I, you know, it's like, I, I it's not, awesome being lumped in with that, but you can't blame people for assuming it, you know, but that said, I do, like, I, I want to make it as clear as possible that, like, that wasn't the case. <laughs> I did work really hard on right. this, uh, and, uh, um, you know, that, is, but, you know, yeah. Oh, go there ahead. Is a, there is a power in, in, like, having a marketing platform where we can maybe get a, a book looked at that is a little right. outside of current not like that, that like, like we can get a book looked at, which is amazing and, and it's hard this, in this day and age for sure. And then you can also like get a book looked at that doesn't fit quite into every genre. Like, oh yeah. And, and like, like you don't have to sort of like fit into the existing marketing machine the same way. And you could do something a little different, which is actually really powerful. <laughs> yeah, no, it was funny because like they didn't know how to market the no, book. No, yeah, the same so, problem. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of the ironic thing was that we pitched or we found submission about four or five months after your book came out. And so like it was this sort of godsend, you know, for me that your book debuted number one because we didn't have any other comps, you know, right. because like adult sci-fi in that like contemporary vein is actually really kind of rare um and mm -hmm. uh like even when i did get uh you know signed i talked to my editor he was like you know they do tend to like to trend chase and this does fall outside of a trend so we have no idea what to expect mm -hmm. um and uh, so I think it is kind of it's not fair uh it is but it is true like i don't think either of our books would have gotten published didn't have a platform because not because hard, of quality yeah. but just because they were like i don't know what to do with this this is yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's so important like it's so important that it like fits into the to to a trend that they're chasing which is yeah. i think you know it makes sense but it's a problem because then you just get a lot of the same yeah that's why like throughout the 2000s like ya just was all like <laughs> <laughs> just all the same. That's why suddenly there was a section in Barnes and Noble called Teen Paranormal Romance. Like, right, yeah. That, there was a section, <laughs> uh, you know, genre. Oh, yeah. Genre and we, we, even, we even hopped in on that. This is, yes, this is called Awoken. This is our Twilight parody that we wrote in 2013. And <laughs> instead of vampires, it's Cthulhu. It's nice. Yeah, it's, it's it, in his house at Relia, Great Cthulhu lies dreaming, dot, 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 of her. Oh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I, I want to add. So that was good, good uh, meta publishing industry talk. Um, but I do have other book questions, including um, if you can talk about this without spoilers. Ooh, how challenge. do you get into the mind of a non-human? Hard think, enough to get into the mind of a human, Lindsay. Well, I think that it's sort of a two a twofold question, which ties in a lot with uh, you know the themes of the book, which is like how does cognition relate to language? And that fundamentally is a question that we don't really have yeah. the answer to. And the, set, the sort of clarity of that question is how do you write a language that you yourself are incapable of understanding? You mm -hmm. know, if sort of like one of the main conceits is like, yeah, maybe we could eventually build like a supercomputer that could decode this language, but we, at our present level of technology, and certainly with our brains being, you know, and our language acquisition devices in our brains, being designed for human language kind of leaves this language completely off limits. Mm -hmm. And so it is kind of hard because it just kind of leaves you in like this extremely 
hypothetical mind space. Um, and, uh, and you can basically kind of describe concepts without being able to like live inside because, uh, you know, one of the central conceits is like, you know, there are some things that you can't explain with words. Then there are some mm -hmm. things that you can't understand, but it is sort of an open-ended, an open-ended question in the field of linguistics, which is what is language's relationship to cognition like when we come up with a thought how quickly are words attached to it are words always attached to it like you know whenever you have like feral children and then they develop their own language how attached to that is to, how attached is that to their reasoning skills and also the fact that like a lot of people don't really attach cognition to like words maybe they attach it to visuals or like numbers or the opposite like i think you 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 have was it dyscalculia um trouble with numbers. Right, right, right. Yeah. Something like that. And so, uh, since it varies so much from person to person, there's just like so much we don't understand about like the relationship of language to cognition. Um, and so I guess like to very long windedly answer your question, I kind of, um, approach it like it's in a sort of hypothetical way, but also kind of in the way that like Tolkien, like in a, in a way. You build the world first. Like yeah, you build their, yeah, yeah, yeah. their species and their relationships. Cause it seems like a lot of thought has gone into constructing yeah, this. I've got like my George R. R. Martin like tome of mm -hmm. <laughs> like world building. I, I think the, in a, in a weird way, the thing that I took the most inspiration from was the way Tolkien wrote about the Ents and how they would like just he would describe the way their language work he would describe the way they communicated and but you didn't really get to see it you just kind of hear like treebeard describe it and then he'd be like mm, mm -hmm. yeah, this isn't really accurate but this is kind of mm -hmm. what you know and so it, it kind of had to be left at that so i think it's like part of it is just allowing yourself to not know the answers to the questions you set up right but at the same time like you're character like Cora at least uh mm -hmm. has significant connection and and you know information sharing and empathy with you know this Her boy. this this uh <laughs> thing that you know no one the, the the they don't understand they can't understand each other very clearly right yeah like, ver like perfectly but like they have that connection which i think is really like a says something kind of hopeful uh so. and really interesting about um about like intelligence um or yeah i guess intelligence is the right term or that term that's yeah look anyway i think and it also kind of assumes that like despite you know vast differences that mm -hmm. uh, in some ways these two species share some core values right and i think in this yeah. case it is that like you know consciousness is is rare and valuable and that it, if you are a conscious being like the kind of the highest thing you can aspire to is to understand this thing that is also intelligent but thinks very differently from you yeah. um and i think that is also kind of you know humanity on a good day you know sort of like a metaphor you know for us mm -hmm. yeah and i think that that's like uh, you know the similarity with my my worldview and like my sci-fi worldview which is that like life is probably not rare but intelligence probably is. Mm -hmm. There's my, and, yeah, uh, that's my answer to Fermi, Fermi paradox. Hi, <laughs> <Not> everybody. <laughs> we, <laughs> we did it. I've got like uh, three competing answers for the Fermi paradox. Um, my answer is, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's probably the best one. Let's wait and see. <laughs> wait, wait and, see. and see. Don't worry about it. Wink. Um, I'm going to uh, go back in our conversation a little bit to this question from James, who asked uh, that, said that both of our books feel a bit YA adjacent. In a good way, in a good way, not in the bad no, way. No, no, I mean, I do. You know the, you know the story, right? I don't know the story. Oh, oh. The I mean, story. I might, I might have forgotten the story. Yeah, the, uh, the, because people keep asking, like, what was the one thing that uh, I changed in order to sell the book? Yeah. And uh, you know, drum roll. It's Cora's age. I changed April's age. Yeah. Yeah, I had to age her up like two years. <laughs> Was, yeah, yeah, I was like, that made all the difference. <laughs> like, okay, thanks, public. Um, that's not, that was not, not, not at my publisher's request. It was just that, like, it, it was my like, agent. He was the make... one that was like, um, yeah, okay. He, he was like, this is, yep. you know, this, I think this, this is good and it could sell. The problem is it feels a little too YA curious because of her age. So just age right. her up a couple what, of years. What's the, what's the, you know, like, uh, 
so the extension of the question is, did you both make a conscious decision to not write slash publish as YA or not? Yes, I never wanted to write YA. Um, I, and I think I, that sounds, I mean, for all the reasons, I think like YA is like a trash fire garbage pit right now. It is like an incredibly the toxic publishing culture. Publishing industry, yeah. Yeah, so it's just the culture, the not yeah. the books, but the culture yeah. around YA is just like incredibly toxic and has only been trending more and more that direction. But yeah. I think yeah, from a marketing standpoint, again, because YA is a, is a marketing term, it doesn't actually mean anything. Um, the, the difference between like writing a young character in a, an adult marketed book and writing a young character in a YA book is, um, are we telling the story with an adult's hindsight, adult's perspective, or are we telling the story from, with the protagonist's perspective? And in both of our cases, obviously, it was like very like in the moment, the protagonist's perspective. There's no like adult hindsight. There's no like, you know, editorializing, which is something I see a lot in like adult fiction that has young characters in it. Um, you you always mm -hmm. see like editorializing like from sort of like the, the narrator um like uh seanan mcguire's book middle game does a lot of that and so uh i even like Gideon the ninth kind of does that um so i feel like every book i can think of with that is marketed towards adult that has young characters has like either adult hindsight or editorializing and neither of our books have that um so mm, yeah i mean i mind a little bit does have the adult hindsight the first yeah she's a little older she's very different she, she's much more oh, mature really? i would just say i read it was like a couple months older like man i, I was a jerk she's been through a lot yeah. yeah it's been a long three months okay <laughs> uh no yeah it's in in it's not discussed but in the in the canon my in my writing canon it's like three years later she's oh okay she's the she's the big two seven <laughs> <laughs> she's ancient yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, she she's a, walk she's her, almost like, a millennial. Yeah. yeah. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, kids to get <laughs> uh, so I have, I have an, I have, I have more questions. Yeah. Oh, wait, but I, I, to, to finish that thought, uh, okay. the reason I didn't want to write YA is A, so I'd have the option for other point of view characters that were older, mm -hmm. and yep. for Cora to get older, and uh, to, for me to get as squirrely as Orson Scott Card did. Can't do oh, that what? in YA. <laughs> <laughs> Squirrely? Yeah, I want to have the option to let it get weird. Just go freaking weird. Yeah. Yeah, I like mean, I want so my sister clone that I kind of want to be. I want. I want to. I want to go 180 years in the future, but but my characters only age up 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. All that. Yes. Um, they stay sexy. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, obviously this book is pretty aware of its genre, and I think that you're very aware of its genre as well. Uh, I would, uh, you know, I know that you, you consume a lot of sci-fi. Mm -hmm. is, is that genre awareness intentional or is it a side effect? I, th I think it started as a side effect and it became intentional. Okay. Um, I guess I'm also curious how, the, how this applies to you as well, uh, since I feel like, um, you know, the process, it feels like it could have gone either way for you. Like it either started genre and kind of got dragged more into the um, <laughs> realism, like, yep. oh, so that was what, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same for me where it started like what, m way more like adventure we, and then mm -hmm. got dragged more and more into like the, the groundedness of the time and like the interstitials and the articles and the politics and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, I think the the main difference in like later drafts was just allowing myself to own the like inspirations and like to make Men in Black references and make Independence Day, you know, mm -hmm. references and stuff like that because you know it's like everybody could tell. So why be coy about it, you know? Uh, so I think allowing myself to own that was you know kind of crucial to finding the tone and also finding the genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the thing about writing First Contact is that it's a story, like, it's a story that's been told so many times. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, there's a reason. And someone asked, why aliens? That was from Isabel. Why aliens? And, and like, the, what, well, why It depends what that why means. Like, why? And it also depends on what aliens means. Yeah. Uh, the sauce linguistics sentences, words. <laughs> um, so, but but I, am, I am curious, what, like, one, why in this for you, but also generally, why is First Contact, why is that such a story that, because that, I don't think it's just that like, we want to have that final, final question answered. I think it's mm -hmm. something more than that. 
No, I think the other thing is like, I don't really think first contact stories reflect potential realities in a very accurate way. Yeah. Like, I don't, yeah. yeah, I don't think that like, you know, a alien is going to come down and be like frenzies, you know, that's, that's not going to be how it plays out. Um, but in my case, I think it's just because I watched ET like 8 million <laughs> times as a three year old in my little, I, I think I actually have a VHS over here somewhere. Um, just one? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you remember that? Old, oh, yeah, there it is. Hold on. <laughs> you all are going to get to see my PJs. She'll be, she'll be right back. Wow, this is this is the real the real author experience. Yeah, see this, I, I had the, the green, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this thing. Um, and I think it's just like, you know, what do you like as a kid kind of inform the kind of stuff you consume as an adult. I just, I like that, you know, and also Beauty and the Beast stories and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think just, especially like growing up in the 90s and that sort of thing, like X-Files, Independence Day, Men in Black. I was obsessed with Men in Black. Like, it's, like I should be embarrassed, except for Men in Black is good. It's so good. Yeah. Black is good, No, it's actually. very good. Um, but I, I think a thing about First Contact is that it lets us see someone else looking at us. Yeah, yeah, that's And like too. throughout our entire lives, we have other humans looking at me. I have people looking at me and like, I see what they think. I can kind of infer or they tell mm -hmm. me what they think and I believe them or not. But then, but like for as our species, like we're the only ones who can look at us. And like, I deeply crave some outside validation. Like, tell me yeah. if we're doing it bad. <laughs> I wanna know. I, I think no space person. There's also kind of an interesting dichotomy there because um, some people uh, are really threatened by the idea that outside eyes might look in and be like, no, <laughs> you know, and doing great. yeah, and and like innately would just be like, you know, we have to fight this and like, you know, let's go full, you know, don't tread on me, which is like the sequel mm -hmm. is coming out October 2021. <laughs> and it'll, it'll be, you know, more in that vein. Um, That's fast. But sometimes, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I'm on draft one and a half. We're getting there. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we're moving, we're moving. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes I just be like walking down the street and, you know, I think everybody has these thoughts. Like imagine describing an alien like uh like when the right. lion king movie came out they had those weird posters of like the voice actors look dead on to like their live action animal selves uh -huh. <laughs> in profile like, how you explain this or or goya yeah. like, the, the donker <laughs> trump posing with a can of beans <laughs> and, and like i'd just be sitting there like imagine mm -hmm. explaining this to an alien and i think like a lot of the fun um, interaction scenes, which I guess I'm gratified to see that like people seem to enjoy kind of arise from these uh, uh, questions of um, mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, I think we need to meet this person. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, there's so many people here. Uh, JK. Um, and there goes my train of thought. I lost it too. <laughs> it was really um, interesting. But you were talking, so you were talking a little bit about your series, um, and Jane asks, do you have any idea how much, how much there is in this series? How much what? How many books there are. Five. How long, how long, five, oh, you know exactly. Yes. You're not going to like, be like five, but actually seven, like some people. No, because I, I think the thing is, once I figure out a structure for things, it rarely changes. Like, I think this was true yeah. of even the first book. It's like the way it was presented changed radically over the years, but the structure itself never really changed. The, you know, reveals never changed. Like mm -hmm. where they happened in the narrative changed. Uh, but like, you know, the, uh, the the relationship dynamic didn't uh, the relationship dynamic never changed the ending was always the same and especially for the second one like there you know there are some plot beats that like changed radically over the years but like the main um, you know structural plot points have been the same since like 2012 um, so yes five Monty Python choke. <laughs> um. I am curious when you are writing, do you imagine, do you, do you imagine it like, do you see it a little bit cinematically when you are writing scenes? Sometimes. I think the I, thing. I feel like, I feel like you do. 
It depends. I think it depends on how well I've thought something out. Um, I do have trouble with blocking, honestly. I think that is something that artists can help <laughs> I with. I don't have trouble with blocking. I ignore it. <laughs> just, like, and then they ran, you know, down the street. And it's like, ah! For a while. <laughs> you know, for, for a period just of time. Be nonspecific and it's all fine. I'm not playing D&D here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, I, 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 in general, yes, and I'll do actually like that has been a thing I've been doing for the second one is like going to locations and like taking pictures and taking video um, and because uh, like a lot of it does take place in like, you know, places that you can go to like uh, uh, a fair chunk of it takes place in Temecula, California and the um, yeah, Pechanga Reservation, which is right next to it. And, um, you know, knowing, you know, just the blocking I think is, is really important, but then there will be times where uh, I haven't really figured the setting out yet and that makes it hard to write because it's like, if you don't know the setting, you don't know the like terrain, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not all deserts are the same. Sometimes they're shrubby and hard to run yeah. in and, mm -hmm. uh, or they're, they're sand and also hard to run in. And we, yeah. we do a lot it of running everywhere around. Yeah. I don't like it. I do like sand. <laughs> <laughs> that was my Star Wars hot take. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, in, in this vein, Jill asks, uh, Lindsay, who do you want to direct a movie version of your book and why is it Michael Bay? Um, no and no one. I don't want a no. movie. You don't want no a movie at all? No movie. TV or okay. nothing. <laughs> oh, I, I'm on board with this. And like, who's going to, what are movies anymore? No, I'm just Except like, that, for like, that sounds like a disaster. Television shows. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm just I like. Watched, I just, I couldn't ha help it. And I watched the Lynch Dune this weekend. I don't know why. Uh, but <laughs> I it was mean, just in, like, for, in the mood for a laugh. <laughs> uh, what, like, why did anyone think this was possible? Why did anyone let David Lynch think I can do Dune in two hours? Yeah. That's doable. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I think in this case, um, so much of the narrative happens off screen that I, I feel like a yeah. movie would just make it even more feeling than it would be. Like, it's like, like yeah. we never, like the main characters never interact with Nils, his core's dad, but he's in the book constantly mm -hmm. off, off screen machinating. And, um, you know, then, you know, there's all the government stuff and then there's characters that like don't, come in until book two, but could easily be written into season one. So like, to me, I'm like, that feels like the obvious one, but I'm also not hurting many, so I can be picky. Yeah, yeah, I have, uh, I just, I told them to go away until I finished the second <laughs> book. I was like, I don't, I don't want it. Yeah, and then it, and then it was like, and now I'm like, I'm done with the second book. Can we talk about movie stuff? And they're like, no. It's, it's <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> I'm not optioning shit. I can't film for 18 months, <laughs> dummy. Um, okay, so dumb? so now, so since you brought up Nils, I have mm -hmm. a, I, so of course science fiction is never about science fiction, uh, not all the way at least. Yeah, and aliens are aliens. So the, 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 this is, you know, they're, they're, you're always talking about something else when you're doing sci-fi, but very rarely are you talking about family. And I don't mean you, I mean people who write sci-fi. And this book is a lot about family. And I haven't heard people talking about that, um, but it's about like messy family and dangerous family and like frustrating and connected and, you know, unconnected and, and like wide, wide ranging family. So like, like the understanding, you know, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're, I don't, you're, your aliens like existing yeah, inside social of structure. multiple social structures and, yeah, and also yeah. allowing us to see that we are kind of part of a super organism mm -hmm. and like all of that family. So from like my dad, I have a contentious relationship with to like my species, I have a contentious relationship with all that stuff seemed like super resonant and interesting. And I, I was wondering like, why, why is, was that a theme and why, I mean, like, cause I just don't feel like it's been done much. Um, I guess like the family tension felt like a very natural extension um, of the main like theme, which is, uh, you know, w when is it 
when are you obligated to be truthful with people, whether it's like your civilization or the people who you are closest to in your life. And, um, you know, in, in a way, like they are, the family is very based on, you know, people that I knew growing up, like not mine. That's, you know, why they keep joking about being Catholic. We weren't Catholic, but um, uh, they, uh, you know, there, there's always this sort of um, underlying tension that is based on like, who told the truth when, what are you hiding from me? And that sort of like being played out writ large with like this big scandal mm -hmm. surrounding like first contact being hidden. Um, so I guess that, that was sort of like the thing that kind of like, carried you know thematically carried it through was like the the question of like you know you know the tagline being truth is a human right but like i you know i didn't want the book to come across like hard line on that um mm -hmm. you know because i i don't think that is always true i do kind of think they're like there is some truth to that, like men in black, like a person is smart, people are dumb, which is very reductive, but like, mm -hmm. you know, truth can be weaponized and the way truth is framed can, you know, do harm in the long run. Um, and I yeah, think- Yeah, because like th there's no shortage of true things. Yeah. And so which ones we pay attention to matter more than the truth itself. Yeah, I feel like you said something like this a few uh, days ago uh, on Twitter about how like the problem isn't access to information. Um, you know, it's not absence of uh, being informed that is the problem, you know, because truth can be weaponized and the way things are framed uh, matters just as much as what the true thing is. That's why there are anti-vaxxers. Um, and, and, so you'll take something that is like, even like in the, you know, like something that's kind of true, like uh, maybe one in a million people who get a vaccine will die weirdly. Mm -hmm. um, and then just sort of like extrapolate that. Well, sometimes people die, that makes it safe. And it's mm -hmm. just, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, well, you know, technically that might be based in truth, but you know, then it, you're getting into this whole thing. So, uh, I, I think it, it you know, I, drawing it back right. to like the family question, you know, it, it was it was an easy way to kind of add some like melodrama to this like broader thematic question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I, that was one of the things I wanted to ask about because I don't feel like you do think that truth is a human right, but like the the your book flap does. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, it's it's isn't it? It's like wow, I want to buy that. <laughs> Um, and that's a, that's an interesting, like, that's an interesting marketing thing to me, but it's also yeah. like, th this is an interesting. Well, it's like, it's the catchphrase of the bad gotta... guy. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like, Cause I saw, I saw someone on like Instagram or something like, okay, who's getting your truth as a human right tattoos geared up. I'm like, no. Oh gosh. <laughs> the, the, uh, but, but, but like the dishonesty among the main characters. So like, not when like the government's hiding information from us, but when the characters are hiding information from each other, that actually is really bad. That does hurt people. And that, right, yeah, does, yeah. that, that like, and it doesn't hurt to hurt people. It hurts like the whole situation. Like yeah, all, yeah. everyone suffers. And they tend to be keeping secrets for like selfish reasons. Yeah. And, and I think that also kind of was like a, like a funny thing that I, you know, it, it was like kind of played as a joke, but also felt true, which is, you know, part of the reason that they're like, well, we better keep a lid on this is because it's an, almost an election year. And mm -hmm. like, it's played like a joke, but I'm like, man, <laughs> yep. Yep. that would, you know, that, that would totally be why. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> There's now a conversation happening in the in the chat about whether uh, it's a spoiler to find out that Nils is the bad guy. Is well, he okay, guy? he's not the bad guy, but he is a huge asshole, and like <laughs> that that doesn't you know he's okay yeah. he's he's not the antagonist. We'll put it that way. But he he's yeah. he is omnipresent throughout the book, and the book begins with you know how much yeah. you know, their their contentious relationship. And I, it's so, it's so beautifully done because, um, you know, like, it's, no, thank like you. That, the fact that they have that contentious relationship, but then like that, that Cora in the end, like, you know, bleh, uh, no spoilers, that uh, Cora like <laughs> recognizes that like, it's still my dad and like still want something there. And yeah, I think that's, that's a relationship that will be explored throughout the series, but I think it's yeah. also sometimes, you know, relationships never really get resolved in feel satisfactory to all parts and uh yeah. you know i guess we'll see i guess I, I don't know is that a spoiler their relationship resolved by the end of the first book <laughs> spoilers <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, um, no, it ends with a big old hug. <laughs> um, the, uh, so it's got to be really hard to deal with conspiracy right now. So to oh, be yeah. writing a book that's about conspiracy in a world that has a lot of conspiracies uh, or conspiracy theories, but not actual conspiracies. Lots right. of, lots of, uh, so like the, we have this problem where the word conspiracy is taken on a new meaning to mean conspiracy theory, whereas mm -hmm. the word conspiracy means a group of people who are secretly doing something. Mm -hmm. And that does happen. Um, yeah. uh, usually it's not a very large group of people. Usually they don't have that much power unless they're just- Like sort of the assassination of Julius Caesar. Conspiracy. Conspiracy. And also yeah. we're gonna turn it into a, a YouTube channel. I'm into oh, it. Julia, I'm into hashtag it. Julius Caesar is over party. Yeah. Where, yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll we'll talk. My people yeah. call your people. <laughs> but so, like, how do you interface with that in a world where, so, like, to to even talk about it, like, you don't want to like lend credibility right, to yeah. this rampant conspiracy theorism that we have going on right now. Yeah, and that was something that, like, I you know, I didn't want to be like hardline like author here. This is you know, like, but I, 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 it's like even though Nils is not a nice person, I, I wanted it to be clear that like he's not a conspiracy theorist in the vein of Alex Jones. He's more mm -hmm. of a whistleblower in the vein of Julian Assange. Um, right. But the problem is whenever you have like people like that do tend to have a lot of support from conspiracy theorists. And that means whenever they stop getting support from the mainstream, they can't help but see those types as, um, you know, mm -hmm. sympathetic. Uh, right. So and they kind of uh, lean into it some yeah. and it's like, oh, great. Well, and then yeah. they kind of believe the stuff themselves. It's not right, like yeah, bunch. yeah like turned out to be a super great hero or anything. Yeah, like someone mentioned Elon Musk and I'm just, yeah, he's totally losing his mind. Like, because leftists were mean to him. And so now he's like, just, yeah, he's he's got a brand, the Kanye brand. Um, but <laughs> like, it, it is kind of hard because I, I, I wanted to make it clear in the narrative that like, there's a difference between like whistleblowers and conspiracy theorists and journalists. Like they're really, they're not the same thing. And mm -hmm. you know, conspiracy mm -hmm. theory is, mentally it's like you want to believe a thing and so any evidence that supports it you throw it in there like if there's evidence that disproves it you ignore it and that is kind of the fundamental basis of conspiracy theory and that's why it is kind of at odds with you know real journalism mm -hmm. um so you know it was kind of hard to like make a book that's fundamentally about uh, conspiracy being proven right, uh, sort yep. of, and not validate that sect. And I, you know, after a point, I don't think it's possible because, you know, people are going to read into it what they want to read into it. And if they already are in that life, they're going to be like, ah, one of us. And I'm going to be like, no, I'm not with them. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be like, in Mean Girls, like, she doesn't even go here. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, four minutes left. And so I'm going to quick question from Catherine who asks, what is that thing on your carpet? It looks like a stuffed mouse. It is a stuffed mouse. It's a stuffed mouse. Okay. Is that your stuffed mouse? Do you like to wrestle? Uh, it, it is. Yeah, I like to chew it. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my dog's. Uh, but yeah. Uh, are, are, there, are there any others? Yes, I've got, I've got a bigger question to actually end on, if you're ready for it. Mm -hmm. It's from Emma who asks, in a climate where public trust, trust in institutions uh, and in science is eroding, how do you think the sci-fi genre could influence that phenomenon? Hmm. It can. Um, yeah, I don't know I if we're capable. I don't, I think, Because we, you know, we just reached the nerds, Lindsay. We just reached the nerds, but even when there's just like a blowout success, um, it tends not to change the way people think too much. Um, I think like Hamilton is a good example where people are like, losing their minds over people, I don't know, humanizing George Washington like they didn't already. Um, and uh, I, I think people maybe give fiction a little too much credit for um, like the, its ability to ch change hearts and minds about like, because I don't think people want fiction that's going to preach to them. You know, if they want yeah. to like change something, they're going to seek out nonfiction. Um, so well, I, I, I think that I think that fiction can definitely change perspective, but I but I think that it's for it, it's like people won't read it if it's not vibing. And I think that's that's a thing yeah. you have now where you can read whatever you like. You know, and like Atlas Shrugged changes a lot of people's minds. Like they read that book and they're like, you know what? You're right. Mm -hmm. Everyone is boring except me, and I'm <laughs> the one who's creating all the value. 
Uh, and, and like, so that, that works. Mm -hmm. um, those like perspective novels work, I think. I get, yeah. And then, and then there's always also like, you know, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, which is yeah. sort of like famously, you know, ch changed some, some minds. Uh, and I, I don't know. I think, I think generally like most of the data kind of shows that like media, people read into it what they already believe. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel like people that uh, were, Atlas Shrug resonates. It's like they already kind of believe that. Yep. And then Atlas Shrug would like give them the language to be like, aha, yes. this is, you know, this provides the framework for what I already thought was true. And mm -hmm. um, it honestly does kind of frustrate me because I've seen people like talk about like how overtly political the book is. And I'm like, <sighs> you know, because I was trying not to be. Like, I was I like, I, I so. yeah, I was like, I wanted to leave the questions open ended. I didn't want to come down on like one side or the other. Um, you know, because, uh, yeah, I, and especially like with the politicians, like they're all kind of flaccid and doopy, but like, <laughs> they, yeah. you know. Yeah, there's a lot of posturing. Uh, it's like, it's more anti politician than it is anti, you know, any any particular politician. Yeah, um, yeah, because I think maybe people, like, because, like, George Bush does a stupid thing, people kind of is like, wow, that must have been satisfying to write, and I'm like, well, no, not really, like, because <laughs> in this universe, things are about to get, yeah, he, he did way worse, and he never got punished for them, and he was never called out for the bad things he did do, and in this universe, things are about to get way worse, so. Yeah, oh, gosh, I don't, oof, was that, a, was that like a, was that like a second book? Yeah. Little little note for us. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm not I mean, surprised it, by it. It makes it hard to write, like comparing our universe to this, like you know, hypothetical alternate past. Because it's mm -hmm. like, what could be worse than what we're living through now? It's like, oh no, not populism, not fascism. <laughs> that would be horrible. Oh no, like. So you. So it turns out you are just going to write yourself into our current situation anyway. Um, certain aspects will follow because I think certain things were inevitable. And I know that sounds kind of be a little pessimistic, but yeah. like I, th I think they're you know you know anyway. history shows that whenever gains are made um, by minorities, um, certain other parties do a little backlash, and I think that was yep. always kind of inevitable. Um, the degree to which it was inevitable and the size of the backlash and how, what form it takes is, yep. um, you know, who can say? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, Lindsay, it is, it is five o'clock. Um, uh, and I've, I've very much enjoyed our conversation. Did I have one last question for you? I probably did. Um, I am seeing some, some requests to end on a positive note. Oh, cause that wasn't really a super positive note. <laughs> but, but uh moby dick oh let's see i can't really yeah see someone had asked about moby dick someone asked uh how many what why did why was there a number of moby dick references um that uh be explored in future entries oh gosh so you gotta give me more money <laughs> and more time <laughs> more of your precious finite time on this on this planet earth Mm -hmm. um is butt legs fight oh yeah butt is legs <laughs> butt is butt i think it's interesting you know i've evolved a little bit on my hard line butt <laughs> is legs perspective where i'm starting to think that butt might be butt when you're standing up and it might be legs when you're sitting down um i know because i don't think you on legs i think legs are not for sitting on what well, i'm sitting on my legs right now oh, like are you, are you like this like <laughs> no, like my thighs. I'm oh. sitting on my thighs and to a lesser extent, my butt. See, I am entirely uh You're yeah. just like just like plopped down. I, I on, on principle, yeah. You sit. <laughs> yeah. For your principle. Uh no, I'm sitting cross-legged, so I can, I can safely say no no legs are hitting this fine mesh feet. <laughs> Do you think, did you, were you always going to be, were you always going to write sci-fi first? Yes. 
Yeah, like that, that was all I ever aspired. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever branch out from that, to be honest. I think, yeah. uh, like, I, I don't know, literary fiction just bores me. <laughs> yeah. No, I no think, offense. I think about fantasy sometimes, but like that's, that's, as, yeah. Uh, I, I need to stay on the nerd shelf. Thanks yeah, exactly. Me. I got to stay, I got to stay in my own thing. Like I was watching a, um, a video by this other YouTube channel, I think it, his, it, Historia Civilis, um, and he did a video about like the, age collapse uh and how like in the space of like a few years every major age empire just <laughs> collapsed and i was like that would be a cool thing to just, like a fantasy thing around and that's not something i have seen so like mm -hmm. stuff like that don't steal my idea chat i'm gonna put a pin <laughs> in that <laughs> that's mine yeah. for like seven to ten years from now after the series is done <laughs> yeah that's the thing you've set yourself a thought to write a lot of books um, uh, but I'm yeah, but they're all outlined, so it'll it'll should be fairly just go right quickly, just like yeah, blow right through it. Okay. Well, I ha I do have to like kind of go do that because like I was supposed to get my agent like a readable-ish draft because <laughs> it's it's mm -hmm. like uh, you know the pot metaphor. It's in pieces right now, so I need to like write in the stage direction. Like, and then they go to the store. I do have a scene in the Cheesecake Factory, um, but it turned really serious and mm. like heavy, and I'm like, I'm gonna have to change this, aren't I? No, I think that's great. <laughs> Juxtaposition is awesome. Well, I think it's because like I'm just I'm just like imagining like this this scene can't happen without a waiter going. Sir, this is Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it can. <laughs> it, the, the, the waiter walks up and is like, so what, so what do you want for dessert? And they're like, <laughs> oh, the, the human race is doomed. Uh, yeah. It's like, look, we know some stuff, OK? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, enjoy your cheesecake while you can. Uh, um, is Malaprop's going to hop back in? I uh, I think they, nope. oh, there's, yeah. Hello. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Um, it was a wonderful chat. And thank you guys, thank you everyone who attended. Um, I think it was a really successful event. Do either of you, Hank or Lindsay, have any closing words? Thank you um, all so much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Hank, for doing this with me. I hope maybe one day we'll get to do it together yeah, again. Yeah. <laughs> One, maybe, yes, like the, said the phrase, maybe next year, like more in the last week than ever in my entire life. But, um, and also for everybody that showed up, you know, thank you guys for uh, coming and watching us and, um, you know, supporting Malaprops. It's one of my favorite bookstores anywhere. Um, so uh, you, your dollars are going to keep keeping indie bookstores running. Um, and so, yeah, thank you guys for your time. And I hope you enjoy uh, one or both of our books. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in um, the disembodied voice of, of Stephanie um, <laughs> from Mal Props to also say thank you so much, um, Lindsay and Hank. You've both been amazing, and the audience has been amazing. Um, and and we've, we've just been thrilled to do this. And uh, we do look forward to a time when we could actually get together in person. It would be yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. So, One glorious day. Yeah. yeah. Culmination. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, sometime. Yeah. Like, some, think it. Yeah, yeah, thinking like point. 10 years ago, the, the Props was the only bookstore I had ever seen in the United States that had a then unproblematic Harry Potter book in the Irish language, which, <laughs> yes, I did buy, and yes, I did lose in ah. Germany. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we can be counted on for, for um, uh, at least I'd like to think we could be counted on for um, lovely random nuggets. <laughs> just like that <laughs> so all right thanks so much everybody we'll go ahead Thank and close you. out um and uh folks will we'll be sending uh, a follow-up email as well so if you didn't catch like the youtube link or you know we'll we'll send that out to you so you've got it thank, thank you, you. Right. thank you good night Bye.